हेलो एवरी वन एंड वेलकम बैक टू माई चैनल आई होप यू ऑल आर डूइंग गुड ड्यूरिंग दिस चैलेंजिंग टाइम्स प्लीज कीप एक्सरसाइजिंग प्रिकॉशंस बिकॉज द पैंडमिक इज एंट ओवर येट एंड आई होप एंड आई रियली विश दैट वी कैन गो थ्रू दिस टूगेदर सो ड्यूरिंग द लास्ट फ्यू वीडियोज वी हैड लुक द लॉर्ड अबाउट हाउ वी कैन यूज द एक्सप्लिसिट स्कीम्स इन ऑर्डर टू सॉल्व सी एफ डी प्रॉब्लम्स यूजिंग मैट लैब सो इन द कपल ऑफ वीडियोज फ्रॉम नाउ ऑन आई वुड बी टॉकिंग अबाउट हाउ वी कैन यूज सी एफ डी फॉर द इम्प्लिसिट सोल्यूशन सो वी वुड स्टार्ट विद अ वेरी सिंपल प्रॉब्लम एज यूजल वी ऑलवेज ट्राई टू बिल्ड अपॉन द प्रॉब्लम्स वन बाई वन सो इन द लेक्चर टूडे आई एम गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट द स्टडी वन डायमेंशनल प्योर डिफ्यूजन सिनारियो सो इफ यू रिमेंबर वी हैड स्टार्टेड इन अ वेरी सिमिलर मैनर वेन वी वर डीलिंग विद एक्सप्लिसिट स्कीम्स एंड दे आर फोर वी वर वी आर यूजिंग द सेम सॉर्ट ऑफ प्रॉब्लम फॉर द इम्प्लिसिट स्कीम सो क्विकली इन ऑर्डर टू समराइज वॉट इज द बेसिक डिफरेंसिस बिटवीन दीज टू स्कीम्स दैट इज सो फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल यू कैन गो टू एनी स्टैंडर्ड टेक्सट बुक सम ऑफ द लिंक्स आर ऑल्सो इन द डिस्क्रिप्शन द काइंड ऑफ टेक्सट दैट आई टिपिकली रीड एंड सजेस्ट फॉर सी एफ डी बट इन ऑर्डर टू अंडरस्टैंड ब्रीफली वॉट द मेजर डिफरेंसिस आर यूजअली इन एक्सप्लिसिट स्कीम्स वी आर एबल टू सॉल्व लेट एस से फी आर डूइंग इटरेशंस then we are able to iterate for any particular variable at any spatial location so let us say you have a point i comma j then you can calculate the value of let us say temperature at i comma j explicitly from the temperatures at other node points so you don't need the values of uh, those other node points at the same iteration so we would we would actually see what i'm trying to say but in implicit methods we can't really solve uh, explicitly i mean that should be very obvious right so in implicit methods we try to solve for all the points simultaneously so previously we were sort of doing an iterative process for each grid point when we were dealing with the explicit schemes but the idea of implicit scheme is that we formulate a set of equations and then we solve for the variable of our interest simultaneously i hope that this would give you some idea if not all but i'm hoping that the lecture today would make it much more clearer so let us get started with the problem statement first so the problem that we are going to look at today is because as i said it would be a steady one dimensional uh, convection conduction case so let us say that we have a rod of a certain length so in this case we are given the boundary conditions and we are interested in the diffusion of temperature so left boundary here is maintained at a temperature of 100 and the right boundary is maintained at a temperature of 500 you can think of them as in being in kelvin so the question that we are posed is how would the temperature vary within the domain if it's of a length 0.5 meter so we are given that the length of this domain is 0.5 meter we are given the boundary conditions and we are asked how the temperature would vary or in another words what would be the temperature distribution within that rod so in order to understand this we are also said that you can assume that there are constant material properties that is the thermal conductivity of this material of this rod is 1000 watt per meter kelvin and we can neglect the changes in temperature in other directions that is it's a purely one dimensional problem and we are also take uh, said that we can take the cross sectional area that is the area through which the heat flux would pass as 10 into 10 raised to power minus 3 meter square so in order to solve this problem we need to know what is the governing equation and because it's a 1d pure conduction equation or 1d uh, pure conduction phenomena we know that we can write the fourier's law of heat diffusion in the differential form as this expression on the top so this particular problem is quite a standard one that is typically used to solve or at least start to solve the cfd problems and this is actually being given in the textbook of worstig and malala sekra which i highly recommend if you are uh, starting to learn cfd because this forms a very good recipe and uh, it gives a lot of ideas of how to develop your own codes even i have been suggesting this book all throughout the matlab series that we have done before so you can check out the link in the description if you are interested in buying this book and it would be a very good and very uh, worthful purchase for what i can say so 
let us see how we can use this problem as a background and then we can use the implicit schemes so before i go into that i want to talk about the basic ingredients of your cfd recipe so the first one is how we discretize the domain and how we can use the numerical techniques so in this example we would use the finite volume methods and we'll see how the finite volume methods would adapt themselves in order to solve the conduction equation so First of all, let us look at the discretization process. So discretization is basically just converting your original physical domain into a numerical domain. So in order to do that using the finite volume approach, what we do is we take this rod as it is and then we divide it into certain number of parts. So what I'm doing is I'm dividing this entire volume of this rod, that is the original volume, into certain number of finite volumes. So here I'm just using different color for the sake of uh, uh, representation. It doesn't mean that I've painted them or something like that. So what I've done is I've taken this entire rod and I've divided it into five parts. So I hope that this should be clear that we just made some markers and we divided them into five parts. So that each part is here, it's called as a finite volume. And that also forms the basis of our finite volume method. Now, the next step is very important. So what we do is we look at the center of each of these finite volume and what we do is we represent the rod as this line, this blue line that you see on the background and for each of the center of this finite volume we substitute a point and these points are called as the node points. So what we are trying to do is we are using our physical geometry and we are trying to get an idea of how we can construct a mesh out of it. And you will see that this particular mesh is slightly different from the kind of meshes that we have used earlier in the sense that previously we used to have certain points on the boundaries as well. But in this case, when we use this kind of discretization, the points are not exactly lying on the boundary and they are lying some distance away from the boundary. And this is the kind of mesh that is being typically employed by a CFD solver such as Fluent for example. So that is why I thought that it would be a good time to introduce these kind of meshing systems. So hopefully the mesh part is clear, it's nothing complicated and we'll now look at how we can actually use the finite volume discretization. So now if I consider any of the node points, so let us say I'm considering this central node point here and if I consider the finite volume corresponding to that. So in order to understand how the discretization would go, we need to understand the indexing or the address of these points. So in general CFD terminology or in even the coding or Cartesian terminology, we usually call our point of interest as an index of I. So you can think of this as a count of that particular node and if this is a point i, then we know that in the positive direction, it would be i plus 1, the next node point on the right, and the node point on the left, that would be i minus 1. So this is a 1D representation of your indexing system that we would be using in MATLAB as well. So in order to jump from here to the finite volume system, I'll go a little bit uh, subtle detail. So rather calling them as i, i plus 1 for now, what we would do is, we would call our point of interest as point P. This point is P. Then accordingly, the point lying east to it, in the directional sense, it's called as a point capital E. And similarly, the point lying west to it, it's called as the capital W. And wherever this finite volume is intersecting your domain, that is this point over here and this point over here, we represent those points as small e and small w and they are representative of the east face and the west face of your finite volume. I hope that this is clear and I'm trying to be very simplistic in my approach. Please pause it here and just rewatch this entire section if there is any confusion because we would be using this knowledge in order to discretize uh, the equations now. So we have looked at uh, the kind of domain that we have uh, achieved at. So now let me try to uh, make you a glimpse of uh, what is really the different kind of nodes that we have in the system. So we had our domain across this blue line and we had certain boundary conditions imposed. And here I have used these black bars. They are nothing but just a representation of boundaries in our system. 
and we had these five nodes for our calculation purpose. So typically in CFD calculations, the nodes that are lying on the boundary or closest to the boundary, such as these two points over here, they are called as the boundary nodes. So we have a left boundary node and a right boundary node. And any points that are not the boundary nodes, they are usually called as interior nodes uh, if they are in, inside the domain. So these are the two kind of nodes that we are that we would be interested in. One is the interior nodes and one are the boundary nodes. And depending on the location, it could be left, right, top, bottom and so on. So because for the discretization process, it could be different or there might be some special treatment for the boundary nodes. That is why it is important to understand what are the boundary nodes in the process and how they would be treated differently. But before we go into that, let me first explain how we handle the interior nodes because they are a bit simpler in our approach. So let us first look at the discretization of the interior nodes. So let us consider the interior node that we have considered before that is the point of interest P. The P could also be this point when you consider the finite volume here. But for now, we'll just consider the point here that is the point capital P and accordingly we'll have some east and the west faces and the west grid points. So in order to do a finite volume analysis, the most important part is we integrate our governing equation. So this governing equation that is d over dx of k dt dx that is integrated on this finite volume and because this entire expression inside the integral was zero, therefore the integral would also be zero. So the volume integrated version of the governing equation is zero. And this holds true for all other kind of finite volume approaches as well. So let us say when you want to solve the Navier-Stokes equation, even so, you, if you want to proceed from a finite volume perspective, uh, always you'll start from that uh, integral version or volume integral version of the differential equation or the governing equation being zero. So that is something it, that's very fundamental to finite volume methods. Now our task is how to solve for this volume integral. So we have a gradient term sitting inside here as an integrand and we have a volume integral. So now we have to look back a little bit probably in our high school or undergraduate level mathematics and from there you can remember or you can probably go back and remember that there is a something called Gauss divergence theorem and according to that we can convert a volume integral to a surface integral if there are gradients like this and when we do it the volume integral becomes uh, the normal vector the dot product of the normal vector with k dt over dx on this da now rather than on the volume we are only now interested in these four boundaries here so now we have converted or simplified the expression a little bit so now what we are interested in is how to solve for this area vector or the area integral so the most important part comes here so we know that this is the k dt over dx that is an expression that is varying in the x direction and it has nothing to do with y direction. So that is why the top face over here and the bottom face, they wouldn't really contribute to it. Or you can also think it that the normal vector on these two surfaces, they are, let us say, in the positive y direction or in the negative y direction. And because this quantity k dt over dx, it's a quantity that varies in the x direction. So when you do this, uh, dot product that would be zero. So therefore there would be no contributions from these faces on the top and bottom. And now if I look at the east face, we know that for this east face, the normal vector is pointing in the positive x direction. And therefore when I do the normal, uh, the dot product of this normal vector with k dt over dx, it would simply be a positive number. And similarly, when on the west face, we know that the negative uh, the normal vector is now in the negative direction and therefore when you do the dot product here this quantity will turn out to be negative. So we'll, we'll do this kind of approach and then I am just writing here that when we do the outward or inward dot product we can get an expression of this form that is k dt over dx evaluated at the east face. And here, because the area is assumed to be a constant, we are assuming that the material properties are the same over here. We are representing the area here and we have sort of uh, resolved this dA into A. 
or we have integrated this da to a and because on the west face when we would come this normal vector dot product would come out to be negative so we have this negative sign over here so here this entire expression that is ka dt over dx that is being evaluated at east face and not just the temperature gradient and similarly for the w phase i hope that this much explanation is clear but if it's not please revisit the gauss divergence theorem and please refer to the textbooks that i've been recommending for you to learn from so now we have come to some simplified version but we can simplify it further so let's look, look into that so we have got this expression over here so now we can simplify it using the uh, central differencing scheme you can say so what we can do is we can uh, substitute for this temperature gradient so remember that this particular point we are interested in the temperature gradient over here so what we can do is we can use uh, the central differencing scheme or some sort of differencing scheme to get the temperature gradients here using the temperature of the node points that surround it so for that we can write so if i write a general expression this k at e becomes k e similarly for the area and the temperature gradient would become t e minus t p and divided by the grid spacing between them and similarly for the west face so i at this point i would recommend you to draw that mesh and try to see if these expression make sense to you until that does please do not proceed further because we would just manipulate this expression now so all the physics of the problem all the approximations have been done at this point and this is where you should be perfectly familiar with the problem statement as well so now having done this it is very easy to see that we have te we have tp and we have tw appearing in the system so we can rearrange this equation very easily in the very standard form of finite volume methods that is aptp equals to aete plus aw tw where aw is given as kw into aw divided by hwp and if we had assumed which the problem said that we have a constant material property we have constant cross section and we would assume a uniform grid so it becomes ka by h similarly the expression for ae also evolves as ka by h and when you evaluate for ap it would turn out as 2 ka by h or in other words the sum of the two coefficients ae and aw so that was the story for the interior grid points all the interior grid points that are in our equations that or in our problem that the point number 2 3 and 4 these are all the interior points in our domain and they would be treated using the same way so if i use this general expression we can write for the second node this node over here we can write ap into t2 that is the point p here equals to ae t3 plus aw t1 and similarly when i consider node 3 we can write this equation and similarly for the node 4 so we have got three equations and we have got five points so we still need two more equations in order to close the system and that is where we would look at the boundary uh, formulation of the boundary points so we'll look at the left boundary point first and we'll see how to evaluate that so for our problem we see that the left boundary is located some distance away from our boundary point over here so again for the finite volume analysis we would consider the same kind of finite volume around that point of our interest that is this point number or the point called as p here so we first of all it is important to see that for this point p we do have a west face but we don't really have a w capital w grid point and that is why it needs special treatment because it can't be molded into the traditional finite volume approach so we first look at the points that are needed that is the point capital e and we don't have the point w that we acknowledge and similarly uh, you can also number this i'm just calling it 1 and 2 so that you can uh, think back in terms of the equations that we had formulated on the previous slide also i'm calling the boundary temperature at the left point as ta so we'll use this uh, notation of ta for the left boundary temperature 
So now if we proceed from the finite volume perspective, we had arrived at this equation over here. So recall that once we integrate the governing equation, we use the Gauss divergence theorem, we take the dot product and then we get this equation. And this is still fine. This is saying that Ka dt over dx evaluated at the east phase minus the same quantity evaluated at the w phase that would be equal to 0. So now if I want to write it using the same approach, we know that we don't really have the expression for Tw here and that is why we can't really stick with the same approach. So rather what we do is in order to evaluate the temperature gradient here, we use a forward differencing kind of system. So you can revisit my lectures on finite differences where we talked about forward, backward and central differencing and that would be really helpful at this particular point. So if I use the forward differencing here, you can imagine or you can very easily see that this gradient that is dt over dx at the w phase that can be written in this particular form that is T1 minus Ta divided by h by 2. So this is a forward differencing estimate of the first derivative and now my grid spacing has reduced to half and also notice that I have just simplified the expression here rather than putting them in terms of this Ke Ae type of form. So we have taken those approximations as well. So now you can see that now I can formulate the expression for T1. So my expression for T1 comes out to be of this particular form where we have some additional term as well. So if I have to talk about it, so I have written this expression in terms of T1, T2, Tw that does not exist and some constant Su or a source constant that S stands for the source term. So the most important thing is that Aw is 0 because we do not really have Tw in this expression over here. So I've, but I have just written it uh, in a general form so that uh, you can later on put the Aw as 0 here. The, const, uh, the coefficients Ae as before it comes out to be Ka by h and when you will do the manipulations you would see that this Su term it would appear from this Ta quantity and it would come out as 2 Ka Ta by h and the coefficients Ap would come as 3 Ka by h. So this is a very standard sort of boundary treatment using the finite volume approach and if you are thinking that it is a bit complicated you can pause here and just try to derive it. It is going to be very easy and it is going to make much more sense if you try to do it on your own or you can try to do it for the other boundary. So for the other boundary I am not going in detail. So we would have the same system here. Now we want to evaluate the equation for the point 5. So for this particular point we would make use of the west point that is point number 4 but we do not have a east point. So that is the problem here. So now if you do the same process, you have to use the backward differencing scheme to evaluate the gradient. Then you will arrive at a equation of this general form and in this equation the Ae would be 0 this time whereas the other coefficients would be something of this particular form. So now if I am trying to put things together, we had 5 different points and now we have got the 5 different equations. I have just uh, colored them according to the number of points so that when we uh, process them further, you can see as to how uh, further manipulations are being done. So we have 5 equations, we have 5 unknowns as well and that is the overall uh, pers perspective of uh, using the implicit schemes that we form uh, or we formulate a set of simultaneous uh, equations with which or with which we can solve in order to get these variable space T1 from T5. Of course, in a general system you would have much more variables or much more number of grid points but I am using 5 in order to make you understand. So now we have got these equations and if you remember from your undergraduate or high school you would remember that we, if we want to solve it we have to mold them in a matrix formulation. So what we do is we formulate these equations of this in this particular form that is C into T equals to D. So I am sure that you might have remembered this as being Ax equals to B but I am deliberately not introducing that particular term as you will see later probably in the next video. So here the T matrix is of our unknown temperature matrix that is or it is actually a vector in this particular case 
So we have a column vector that is t equals to t1, t2, t3, t4, t5 and our objective is actually to calculate this t variable. The d variable it constitutes of the source terms that are the terms that are appearing on the right hand side that does not include the variables. So you will see that we have only that variables in the first and the last equation that we have certain source term out of the boundary conditions but for the interior nodes all the terms have a, uh, do have this t1 or t2 or t3 or so on. So there that is why they do not have any source term over here. The final and the most important part of this uh, solution process is the matrix C. So in order to calculate the matrix C it is important to note that you have to take these terms on the left hand side all the terms that have these T of any grid points we have to make them move on the left hand side and once you do that for every point in the domain so we have 5 points and that is why I have done this color coding here. So if I look at this first equation we know that the coefficient of T1 is AP so that is sitting here the coefficient of T2 would be minus AE if I move it on the left hand side then it would be minus AE and for T3, T4, T5 we simply have 0. So now if I consider this uh, black equation for example we do not have a coefficient for T1 and T2 in this particular equation that is why the T1 and T2 entries are 0 and then if I move these two terms on the left hand side the T3 would have a coefficient of minus AW, the T4 has a coefficient of AP and T5 would have a coefficient of minus AE. So that is what we have here. So in this way we can formulate this particular C matrix and recall that all these coefficients they depend on K, A, H and so on. So there are some form uh, some manipulations of the properties that we already know. So the matrix C is a known matrix. The matrix D would also have the influence of boundary conditions that are known. They would have the influence of K, A, H which are known. So you know the source matrix D, you know the coefficient matrix C. So what you now have to do is very obvious you just have to flip or take the inverse multiplication of the two and that would give you the temperature matrix. So probably I will look at that in the next video in order to get the get you digest this information and try to do it on your own. So in the next lecture we will actually look at that but before we conclude this lecture I want to give you a very brief overview of how to do these things in MATLAB using the algorithm that we can develop. Also if you want to solve these kind of problems in python if you want to use the CFD related solvers if you want to develop CFD solvers using python I am currently running a members only course that is available to member of this channel and you can take the membership by clicking on the join button somewhere around here and through that you can see that uh, if you want to use or if you want to increase your uh, programming skills and if you want to include python that is one of the very widely growing platforms you can also use that to solve the CFD related problems. So let us look at how the algorithm is for these kind of matrix based solvers. So first of all we have to initialize the problem. So that means that we have to define the number of grid points. Then we have to define the boundary temperatures that is 100 and 500 or TA and TB. Then we can define the material properties that is K and A. And using the number of grid points we have already allocated what is the grid spacing H. So now once we have all this information we can formulate both the coefficient matrix C and we have we can formulate both the uh, and the source matrix D. So once we construct the matrix. So that is why I have put that in bold because that is the only part where you have to be very cautious because if there is a little bit of slip up in the matrix formulation you might still get a solution but that may not be the true solution or a feasible solution. So make sure you pay special attention while you construct these matrices and that is why I am giving you a certain time to gulp up this information before we actually look at the coding part to obtain or construct these matrices and the final part is then simply solve uh, this particular uh, matrix system that is CT equals to D using the inbuilt algorithms that, mat uh, that MATLAB is really very good at.